pretty Polly, well yonder she stands. Where's pretty Polly, well yonder she stands. A ring on the fingers of her lily white hand. I'm here to tell you about a book that's been struggling to be born. My adult children complained, I have two of them, and they complained that I never taught them the old songs. In fact, they didn't want to even hear them. They didn't want them. And so I decided to make them a little songbook. And I have this picture up here. I didn't paint it. It's by an Englishman from, he died in 1944, but it, this shows ladies coming home from the pub. And this is my idealized relationship with my daughters. <laughs> that we would be skipping happily down the street. But they did complain, and I decided for Christmas I would make them a little songbook. That was last winter, the winter before. I thought I'd just get three copies. I'd go on that Shutterfly or Butterfly or whatever it is online where you make a little book. And I thought I'd get three copies, one for each of us, Sarah, Eli, and me. And I would tell just the songs that had stories that I really love. Those are ballads that tell a story. And for each one, I tell the ballads history, just a little history, because they're always interesting. And then why not some illustrations? I thought, oh, well, why not some photographs? And I thought, no, no, no. Why about photographs of whistles? And I hadn't been making whistles for a long time, because my mother had gotten sick, and she taught me to make whistles. And it made me sad, and I couldn't do it anymore. And some painful years passed, but I just painted really awfully bad pictures to make up for the loss of this great love of my life. Anyway, so I thought when I, this idea came in, all of a sudden I wanted clay in my hands. And I started working again after a long, long wait. And it was thrilling. And so then I thought I would make story whistles. And there I am in the open, one of these open studios that the Craft Council puts on. And I'm whistling away as if it had never, that 15 years had never been taken out of my happy life. And that picture is by Leah Greenberg. She takes wonderful pictures. And um, anyway, I thought, why not make story whistles for my girls for the illustration? And I want, because whistle making is my family tradition, and because story whistles are my invention. So I wanted to, them to be more interested in what our family did and what I do. And so I thought this would be a way to trick them into it. And I, so I began really working happily. It was Mark's idea when I said, I want clay in my hands. He said, let's go out and get some. And we drove out and got a big lug of clay. And I came home and got right to work. And I was happily making these ballad whistles. And then I, had, I couldn't stop working. I was having so much fun. And things began to get a little complicated. A publisher, probably sicked on me by my sister Nona. She was the captain of our childhood lifeboat. <laughs> And she saved us in many ways, many times. But she also has been very, very helpful in pushing her younger sisters forward. And so some of us fight and don't go forward. But um, she somehow this publisher said he wanted to publish this little book. And he said it could be any way I wanted. Well, if you've ever worked with publishers, that's unheard of. I said, any way I want, any way. And he said, any way you want. So I really flew into action with renewed energy. And I soon had dozens and dozens of finished whistles. And each one was accompanied by a really stout, hearty essay. And I was doing really well. And that publisher, then I sent him some examples of pictures and, es and essays. And he said some things that surprised me. He had ideas of his own. He wanted the essays to be shorter, and not so many of them, and not so academic. And couldn't there be painted illustrations? It's like painting a pretty Polly. Okay. She's singing her own song, which is a little confusing. And he saw that, and he thought, oh, maybe not painted illustrations. <laughs> and so that was the last idea that he came up with, was a real humdinger. What about ballad crankies? a book with scrolls that pulled out. And I thought, nobody in the world could figure out how to print it. But couldn't that be in the, in the book, Crankies? So suddenly, this book, and I really adore books. I like making them and playing with them and looking at them and just having them in my hand. And so this book was no longer for my daughters, but it now has become embarrassingly concerned with three fascinations of my entire life, which is a long time. These fascinations are all really old. They're so old that the book and this talk 
could be titled Three Archaic Pleasures. <laughs> okay, so my interests are definitely not the interests of the world. And it would seem that there's one of the things to explain what's going on in my mind. This is St. Francis preaching to the banjos. <laughs> that is an uncontrollable instrument, and I love it for that reason. But there it is. That's what's going on that seems that very odd things come out of my mind. And it would seem that all my life's work are wove, woven out of endangered and nearly obsolete traditions. And even that possibly includes books, although I hope not. OK, so where did these fascinations come from? All are ancient crafts. All have been brought to life by the human breath, because a book is really best when it's read out loud. All are fun for me. And as are painting and writing about them. And I was happily clicking along with this new idea from the publisher when I had an epiphany by my from my daughter. I'll tell you the short version of the epiphany by daughter. And hopefully, if you have daughters, you won't get many of these. This one happened at 1 in the morning, which here is sleeping time. But in California, it's not. Um, <laughs> she, uh, she said, um, what are you doing? And I described this problematic book. And she then asked me two questions. This was Eli. Uh, she said, well, what did you feel the first time you saw a television? And I, I, oh, I was disappointed. I was four years old. And the TV was about this big. And everything was gray. And it was a baseball game that was being filmed from an enormous distance. And I was disappointed. And she said, well, what about the first time you saw a cranky show? And I said, I was thrilled. My first cranky show was Rats. Peter and Elka Schumann and the Bread and Puppet Troupe were spending their first winter in Vermont. And the Vermont air at that time was tinted with patchouli and weed. And, <laughs> and Peter, and, Peter and Elka were above that kind of thing and beyond that kind of thing. But their audience was almost always bright-eyed hippies who built this. And if you see it on the outside, you think, what a thrilling building. But if you go inside, it's just nonsense. <laughs> There's no usable space that doesn't have some sort of drop-offs or calamities. And um, so they were beyond all that. And Bread and Puppet, though, was based on ancient sen sensibilities. And I think that was one of the reasons that I was immediately attracted to them. Even the woodblock images they create have something about them that seems medieval. But they're not aping a medieval artist. They're using an old form, and they've carried it forward to make it become a vessel for information now. And so as my daughter said, there's a message for me in my memories. She said, I've always been interested in certain human creations and not others. And they have to have been ripened over a vast expanse of time. So they're artifacts with lineages, and they've been made eclipsed by electronics and by technology. They are redundant. So what is this? The very idea makes my brain spin in a really weird way. I tried to make a photograph to show what I was thinking so, I could, so it would make sense to you maybe, but it doesn't make sense either. And so here it is. It's a kind of a nonsense alchemy. And here's an image that is of a crystal that's strangely important to me. It shows the image I've done over and over my whole life of a person or any creature as a passenger on a bird. Okay, Why? My mother made birds, but she didn't do this to them. They're not being asked to carry all my hopes and dreams. And so there it is. It's Google Presence is in the background. If you go online, you can see this whistle living in the mysterious electronic world. And then in front of it is the little whistle having its picture taken. And here it is in my hand. And those three iterations of this whistle are by no means the end of, of what goes on within the human mind when you're talking about artifacts or art. And that's really interesting to me and makes no sense. And it might seem silly, but this sequence tells me that I'm asking old forms to work across time. I'm asking them to carry messages that are old and messages that are new. And I'm asking this little bird to make music that birds don't make. Maybe they do. And this little girl whistles. The excitement of riding a bird, I guess. And I. I want them to, my work to be loaded with warnings and facts and painful truths about human existence and all existence. And I want it to carry social knowledge, the accumulated social knowledge that we have had throughout time. And if they're funny, so much the better. So though I was raised in a folk tradition, 
I admit I'm focused on the revival of these antiquated objects and that act. They, I want them to speak about my interest in storytelling. And so my objects of fascination are the clay whistle, stories, ballads, and songs, and books, and a form of panoramic theater based on painted scrolls, which nowadays is called the cranky. These artifacts have always been used for information carrying vessels, and all were forms of entertainment that once were precious to human existence, and all are obsolete. So I love them. Okay. As I work, I really delight in pulling the circle closed. For on the cranky, I'll spend hours on a computer mining online archives and history files to find out what I can give to my creations to carry them into the future, but what comes from the past. And so they become little time capsules. And now, toward the end of my life, all these creative fasc fascinations of a lifetime have entered into one flowing stream in my mind, and it's sweeping me along in a really pleasant way, and I wish that for all of you as you get old. It's really very, very wonderful. Okay, foremost in that stream of whistles, stream of flowing information are whistles. And the whistles came in with the caveman. Ancient bone whistles, they mostly were started off like a transverse flute, right? that you're going across, and then some wise guy or woman thought of the idea of fixing a, fi fixing a mouthpiece to it so you didn't have to always be adjusting to get the sound. It would stay in place no matter what, how you held your mouth. And so that was the first great advance, and the last great advance in whistles. <laughs> Except for somebody in medieval times who thought, oh, if we hook a tube to that with finger holes in it, we'll have a, a more usable instrument. So that was the last great advance, the recorder. Okay, that was a whistle that got a, a fingering board. Okay, so this ancient, these ancient things have been with humans throughout the entire human adventure, adventure, and they're amazingly varied and they're inventive. And some ancient cultures produced them in such numbers, particularly anyone from Central America on down, they produced so many of these things, crate loads of them, that you might think that they had important uses. Why would they make so many of them? And they've been found by the ton in some Mayan tombs, but they're also found in simpler settings. There's a Mayan uh, in a king's tomb. His, the, there's someone up there blowing a whistle. Someone else is blowing some other kind of honker. But there's a little whistle just like has been made forever by humans. And They've also been found in the loving person who placed a little bird whistle in the hands of a dead child when she was being buried. And now when archaeologists dug up this simple place that wasn't a fancy tomb, they found this little skeleton of a small girl, maybe seven, holding a little bird in her little skeleton hand. And perhaps it was her favorite toy, but whistles aren't always toys. They are discovered in archaeological digs of all sorts and all over the world. Every culture has had them. And they're almost always made about the same way. You find them in old outhouses where they fell out of someone's pocket when they pulled down their pants to pee. Or moats or in ruins of castles. Moats were a big source. And ruins of castles <laughs> and cottages and forts. And their settings suggest their uses, their spiritual practices, or for music, or for signaling, or hunting, and especially as toys, which they still predominantly are today. For me, as a lifelong whistle maker, all thanks goes to my mother and to her father. That's my grandfather. And he was born in 1882. He was an old man, my mother said, when she was born, already an old man. I don't think he was all that old. But uh, he was born in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And he was a man who was remembered. He lived within the traditions of his community. And he was remembered as a man who made whistles to amuse children. My mother, there she is. Looks like she has radiant antlers, but she didn't. <laughs> um, she was wonderful, though. Uh, she was, perhaps she was initially inspired by her father's tours, toys or by something called fairlings. Fairlings were tiny whistles. Now these are tiny. I put a penny in the picture and then hated how it looks like made another picture. But a penny is that big next to these little things. They're tiny, tiny little whistles. One note, just a little happy squeal. And they were what you won at county fairs for prizes. Nowadays you get a huge teddy bear that won't fit in your car. <laughs> but then they gave out fairlings. And you can still get them online. The price has gone up on them, but they're still cheap because people don't know what they are, why they have them in their grandmother's attic. So um, 
She made whistle making her life work and she passed it on to me. Nona made one whistle once and said, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> but it was beautiful. It was, a, it was a Bob White or some bird with big cheeks. Okay, so for me it's been a long and delightful obsession and it's perfect for contemplating almost any topic under the sun. And here are some of the larger whistles that I made. Okay, this is called the corporate whistle. It actually sold to a corporation. It was big. My daughter Eli said, Mom, you need a forklift to pick this up. And it's true, it was heavy. And way in the back, and you can't see her from this angle, is a tiny little woman fighting to get seen. She has on a black suit with a tie, and she's really trying to fit in with the guys, but they aren't letting her forward. We hope things have changed since I made this many years ago. But it's in some corporate office now, ornamenting their space. That's the, some people are really not very religious and should stay off that topic. Um, <laughs> that's the last supper, it has dogs there that are out here, they didn't fit in the picture. And they're just only eating bread and apples, and that sounds like a good thing. And that's Pontius Pilate, he has a horrible stomach ache. <laughs> and that, and you, if you blow in his foot, he goes, <laughs> So there I get some, some say in what's in the Bible, I guess. The next one. That's a beautiful, beautiful whistle called Risking All for Freedom. I was on a beach in Flor Florida with my in-laws who liked very fancy places, and I don't like fancy places. And there were waiters coming out and serving daiquiris on the beach and stuff like that. It was awkward. And down the beach, five miles away, the boats were tumbling in the waves, dropping the boat people into the water to drown as they were coming from Haiti. And it was so horrifying to me, this, this contrast between what I was doing on this beach and what was happening five miles away and what happened in Haiti that people would prefer to put their little babies in a boat than to stay there. And so I have all these people crammed in a boat and because the boat has a bird, they're going to get to wherever they want to go and hopefully have a, give them a good life. All those pictures were by Jose Benitez of St. Johnsbury, by the way, though. Okay, so obsolete item number two, ballads, the story songs. This is a painting by Thomas Hart Benton about people enjoying a ballad and the kind of topics that we are now involving ourselves in. That's up there, the woman going like that, a bottom, a, a, what's it called, a, a bosom ripper. Yes, that's what books are called that look like that. Okay, I have a hair that's tickling me. Bodice rippers. Yeah. Okay, all forms of music were vital parts of our childhood, and that included folk music and old ballads. We lived in a region where old time music was still alive, and both of my mothers and all five of my sisters all sang. We sang at church and on car trips and around the campfire and on school, the school bus and while we were picking beans and when we were doing the dishes and at school and with friends, everywhere. And by the early 60s, the folk revival was in full swing. I was just finishing high school in 1963, I guess it was, and singing was, became even more common. Forgotten musicians were being re even rediscovered, and that was exciting. And the folk revival was really fun. And then it slid into the hippie years, and music kept the wheels rolling. And here's my sister Charlotte. She's the next one after between Nona. She's between Nona's age and my age, and she's there holding her guitar in the ruins of Berkeley with her her hippie husband and, and, and their dog Termite. Long gone. <laughs> but uh, they sang these songs, and he actually became a professional musician who plays at the trolley car in Turnaround in San Francisco. And all the money he makes singing old songs at the trolley turnaround, he sent four children to college. So it's not nothing to be a musician, I guess. And that's what the people were doing a lot of then. And as a consequence of those years, Music was being passed along from person to person at every party had music. You didn't go to a party and accept there was music. And so as a consequence, I know thousands of songs. Now, this book that I'm allegedly working on was called Narrative Songs and Musical Sculptures. But then Crankies got added, and the book, which had been an exploration through art and essay of 35 British ballads, here's, well, you'll recognize some of them, this, the color's not just right in this one, but the, the, it's the, the nut brown bride and Lord Thomas. He's asked his father, which girl should I marry, the, the one I love or the nut brown girl? And he's, the father says, marry the nut brown girl, she's rich. And any time in a ballad, if you ask your parents for advice, 
all hell is going to break loose. <laughs> this should never be done. You should never ask your parents for advice. So because he marries the not brown girl, but his true love doesn't like it. She dresses up like a bride and comes to the wedding, and the br actual bride gets mad and kills her. And then everybody gets killed by him. And it's a really bad, bad ballad. That, and sadly, actually a beautiful ballad that ends sadly. But next one. There's the old father. He's creeping around in the back looking to give someone else bad advice. Next. <laughs> oh, this one was a ballad we sang in grade school. I'll give you a paper of pins, for that's the way true love begins. But we sang it boys against the girls very loudly, and nobody ever mentioned that this was a medieval ballad of extreme obscenity. Uh -huh. That's what it came from. All that had floated away and just left a children's song. Yeah, oh, here's old Bangham. Old Bangham was a story about a knight in shining armor back whenever that was, whatever the date was that. He did that one out. He killed giants and crones and trees and all kinds of wild behavior. It goes on for 56 verses. It came to Appalachia and ended up with four verses about a man who goes and kills a pig. And it's now called not Sir Lionel, but Old Bangham. And it's my favorite, my favorite band show song. And it's a very singable song. The words of the chorus have remained the same since it first was ever written down. And that was hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So there, not a next one. There, though, there's Sir Lionel. See, there's a naked lady in a tree. He's going to save her, but he goes off and forgets about her. And uh, there's the giant pig, that, the mythic boar that he kills. Is there another? Oh, there's a little boy on the road who's beset by a devil who asked him riddles when there were no TV riddles were really popular. And a lot of the very earliest songs are riddles. And they often were extremely obscene. You have a riddling game to keep from being assaulted sexually or whatever. That's how you get out of it if you win the game, if you're clever. And uh, they've all been stripped down by time until now they've come to us. I gave my love a cherry as no stone. There's no sign in that one that that was really an obscene song of bad things were happening. This little boy is much smarter than the devil. And he stands right strong in, in place and fights him back. And every question the devil asks, he gives him better than he was asked. Oh, and that one came to America, and instead of a devil on the road, it's a fly. Yeah, no one knows why. Uh, I do, but I'm not going to tell you. OK. The one that was up there, well, it was the, the de farmer's first wife. And she goes down to hell and hits the devil's children on the head. Who knew the devil had children? I never knew. He procreates. This is horrifying. And so she hits him on the head with wooden spoons and other things and bashes her brains out on the wall. And he's so disgusted with her that he takes her back to her husband, who doesn't want her. And she skips across the field saying, this proves, look, how, look at me, I'm better than anybody, I'm better than men, I went down to hell and I've come back again. And so those ballads were very popular and if they're funny, they're less likely to have changed for some reason. Nothing to draw. This is a one of, of folklore said that you could travel across America in 1920, say, and if you collected in every town the version they sang of Barbara Allen, you could tell where that, where that town in England or Scotland or wherever that that community predominantly came from by the version they sang of Barbara Allen. So that's them crossing the plains, yodeling away. Whistles, proceeds from the old ballads, and they're followed, for, for the little book I made, the old version is followed by the new version, so that there's a whistle of each. But then the crankies crowded in, and the book started moving in really new and unpredictable and somewhat madcap directions. So what is a cranky? This is our third obsolete. What is a cranky? It's a box. It's a pre-industrial viewing device. It's a box with a window on the back there. You can see the window there. And you can't see it because it's got a scroll in the way. But through the window, one sees portions of a panorama on a painted scroll. And they get cranked past the viewing window. And you can watch it. And music or narrative may or may not be supplied. And they were immensely popular everywhere in the 1800s. Anyway, some were tiny. This one would fit right in the palm of your hand. And it was a little cranky about the Boer War. And it's English in a little museum. But it's tiny. You turn those little knobs, and a little scroll goes past and shows the horrors of the Boer War. And some were huge. This one goes on for miles and miles. It's in the Gloucester Whaling Museum. And it literally goes like this down, loops and comes back and comes back. And that was of a whaling voyage. I must have taken about the length of a whaling voyage to watch it. And who knows how they cranked it, whether they had mules or what.
you would go to fairs or in theaters in the 1800s and you could see these giant moving scrolls. And they'd always be of some sort of adventure. Whaling voyage, trips down the Nile, trip down the Mississippi. You'd go down the Mississippi and then you'd leave the theater. The next people would come in and they'd go up the Mississippi because nobody wanted to rewind that massive thing between shows. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so Mark Twain told funny stories about a cranky show and about a theater with doing crankies that traveled on the frontier in America. And, and they were ridiculous stories. So they, they lost their piano player. He didn't say, wow, how we could make that mistake. But they lost him. And then the next town, they needed a piano player. So someone said, oh, that guy plays the piano really well. So they hired him. But he turned out to be a dead drunk. And so he played enormously gusto-y kind of thumping, embarrassingly inappropriate music. And that was the whole story, is what it was like to have this sad story unwinding with songs you only could know from a brothel being played on the piano. <laughs> and so that was mostly forgotten now. And crankies are still cherished by puppeteers. There they are. The word cranky was coined by Peter Schumann. It was before that it would have been a panoramic theater or something like that. And yeah, so it's still cherished by puppeteers and by activists and ballad singers. Activists love it because you can go out in the street and play something quickly and break down fast. And people with an interest in the past, that's Carolyn Shapiro, and that scroll has been tossed out onto the, to the floor of the labor hall to show sort of how, what it looks like when you unroll a whole scroll. It's really very exciting for me. Okay, so, but tonight is really about this one page of this struggling book. And that page is a page about Pretty Polly. And this is a song I've known for 60 years. And to learn more about it, I sifted through historical documents and books and online because I wanted to know the ballad's beginnings and how it changed over time. Here are the words of one critic talking about Pretty Polly. Quote, depending on the version, things can take a cringe-worthy turn involving incest, insanity, premeditation, pejorative language, obsessive behavior, and of course, the supernatural. It's no wonder that this story continues to be one of the most popular and widely covered of the, <laughs> of the folk music world and beyond. To put it plainly, it's a messed up story and his, and his opinion. Um, but time has tidied pretty poly up, but the critic is still right. Even tidied, it's a brutal story of seduction and murder. In its current watered down modern version, pretty poly is very much shorter, but it's still a cautionary tale. Where did it come from? England. It was brought here again and again, traveling with waves of immigrants. Your ancestors might have brought a version, and mine certainly did. As they sang, details were admitted, but the important elements all remained. Now, Pretty Polly is considered to be the great American crime ballad. But 300 years ago, it was a small thing, at least till it was seized and reworked and printed as a British broadside called the Gosport Tragedy. Broadsides were printed song lyrics that looked like that, and here she's holding one on the street to sell them. They were sold on the street for next to nothing, and it was a new way to learn songs, and musicians sang them on street corners to earn a living. And so here's a person holding a broadside scroll as she sings, and people gather around, and they're going to be expected to pay her. That's a lovely sketch, I think. It's someone named Tomlinson. And um, so usually, the poetry in Broadsides was cribbed together by hack poets taking, they take real life scandals and write them into verse and crimes were very popular for their material. Old songs would be taken and spruced up with new information, place names were put in them, or popular elements from other ballads. And there was ridiculous flowery language that was imposed on most old ballads during the Broadside period. And Pretty Polly was one of these. The public liked Pretty Polly and they sang it. And nobody knows what tunes they sang, for they changed both the tunes and the words to suit themselves. The fancy poetry was replaced with everyday words. No one wrote down the old tunes, but the appellation Pretty Polly has a minor tune called Mountain Modal, and it suits the story. In this way, it flowed along, changing as it went. Molly, who was the old version, became Polly, and William was shortened to Willie, and 36 verses dropped to less than 10 but they still contain the tale in all of its gruesomeness. The history detective for Pretty Polly was David Fowler. He was a university graduate student in the 1970s, and he laboriously examined old records and found strong evidence this story 
was told about an actual murder that happened in 1726. The British Library has one of the first printed broadsides of Pretty Polly from early 1700. It was, but scholars say it wasn't entirely new at that time, that it contains many older elements. Polly inspires all sorts of art, and Pretty Polly is the queen of the murdered girlfriend ballads. There's a whole genre called the murdered girlfriend ballads. And, um, but she's the queen, Polly is. In ballads, all bad, bad men are named Willie. And Pretty Polly has a narrative moving between Willie's voice and a little bit of neutral observation and then Polly's concerns. She knows that she's been tricked and she knows nothing is going to go well for her. So the lurid details of Polly's fall from virtue and unmentioned, nowadays an unmentioned pregnancy, were openly described in the old broadside but now have been dropped. These details are probably why Pretty Polly was excluded from Francis James Child's 1890 massive collection of early ballads. As a Victorian gentleman, Child avoided dirty songs. And he disliked the tawdry sentiments that emerged from the gutter press. So the Gosport tragedy probably offended him in every way, although he'd like Pretty Polly now. Pretty Polly always contains supernatural elements. Originally, the murderer escaped on a ship as Pretty Polly's ghost chased him. This is a comic book of Pretty Polly that's on the ship. He could use the old version because it's more, more dramatic, I guess. And in that, Polly's ghost is so powerful, she, he dies of fright, or he becomes a raving maniac, or, and she tears him to pieces. In some versions, her ghost is so powerful that she sinks the whole ship. But all those ideas were stolen from other ballads which was a very popular thing for ballads to do. And by sometimes when you're singing, you realize the verse you're singing is in about three other songs. OK, in the American versions, Pretty Polly has become a really wispy remnant of the powerful super ghost that she was in the old days. Sometimes you get an eerie ghost of Polly after her death. The, the version I'm going to sing during the Cranky repeats an opening verse about rings on the fingers of her lily white hands. And the last time that's sung, you're supposed to that's her as a ghost, because you know she's dead then. And usually, wild birds grieving her death is the ending of Pretty Polly. When I sing it, most of the time, I end it there. But I went ahead and put in the last creepy verse to make you feel scared. Okay. Now, so Woody Guthrie, the great American songster, used this sad and lonesome tune for his great song, Pastures of Plenty. It's a celebration of migrant workers and a really fabulous song. And that alone shows that great things can come from a sad story. And so it gives me hope for my odd book. Now, I'll set up the cranky, which will take a second. With, with primitive technology, there's so many things that can go wrong. OK. I sing this just the way I learned it when I was 12. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, where's pretty Polly? Well, yonder she stands. Where's pretty Polly? Well, yonder she stands. Got rings on the fingers of her lily white hand. Oh, the rings on her fingers, they shine, shine like gold. Rings on her fingers, they shine, shine like gold. I tell you, Polly's mine before the night is old. I courted pretty Polly, I courted her so sweet. I courted pretty Polly, I courted her so sweet. Polly, she be dancing, and we be dancing to me. I court pretty Polly the whole live long night. Court pretty Polly the whole live long night. I left her next morning before it was light. Oh, Polly pretty Polly, you'll come and go with me. Polly pretty Polly, you'll come and go with me before we get married some pleasure to see. So she jumped on behind him and away they did go. Jumped on behind him and away they did go over the hills and the valley below. 
He led her over hills and the valley so deep. Let her over hills, the valley so deep, and Polly she mistrusted, and she began to weep. Oh Willie, oh Willie, I'm feared of your ways. Willie, oh Willie, I'm feared of your ways. I'm fearing you're going to lead me astray. And they rode a little bit further, and what did they spy? They rode a little bit further, and what did they spy? A newly dug grave and a spade lying by. Oh, Willie, oh, Willie, I'm feared for my life. Willie, oh, Willie, I'm feared for my life. I fear you will murder me. I'll never be your wife. Oh, Polly, pretty Polly, you guessed just about right. Molly, pretty Polly, you get just a right. I dug on your grave the best part of last night. And he stabbed to her heart and her life blood did flow. He stabbed to her heart, her life blood did flow. And into the grave pretty Polly did go. He throwed a little dirt over her, he started her home. He threw a little dirt over her and started for home, leaving no one behind but the wild birds to mourn. So where's pretty Polly, well yonder she stands? Where's pretty Polly, well yonder she stands? With rings on her fingers and a light shine round her hand. working on has often two sides. Yeah. And I, we saw two pictures, and uh, we didn't understand that one was on one okay. side and this, one on the other. This whistle has on one side Pretty Polly being ready to be shoved in her grave. Uh, like yeah, Pretty Polly ready. being ready to let me around. Pretty Polly is going to get poked into the grave. Here's the little bird ready to breathe. And around the back is the gospel port the old story of her chasing down the ship that she's going to sink to revenge herself on him. And so I tried to do that in most instances because I, it got so cumbersome having two whistles early and later. But it's been a great pleasure, this project. Mm -hmm. And this, this madcap part of it has certainly been a thrill. I just can't understand why you killed her. In the old version, the old broadside version, she was pregnant and is quite clear about it. But by the time the puritanical strain runs tight in America and that kind of thing gets dropped out of a lot of ballads, there's no mention of that. And the editor said, Why didn't you make a new verse? It explains that. And I said, Well, this is an ancient ballad. I really don't feel like I can make a new verse. And he looked a little bit like that was a break deal breaker. We'll find out. But he wanted me to in some way explain why. He said, this just turns him into a psychotic killer. And I know, right. yeah, but he, <laughs> he was. She, he was, but she's, in the old, oldest versions of it, she's, they openly describe what's going on. They're very lurid and clear in what's going on. So, so that it was his know. child. What? Or was she already pregnant? When? No, it's his child. She's an innocent girl who he seduced, and then, and then he doesn't want to marry her. Yeah. But now there's no explanation. But nowadays there's no explanation. You're just supposed to intuit it. It's just yeah. Yeah. Maybe you could do a new version since there are already so many versions. Okay. That's to where she kills him. But she kills him. I'm working on my fourth prank of this of this set. And the fourth one is for a, a old, old song, a medieval song called Nottingham Town or Nottingham Town. Mm -hmm. And if the first verse is in Nottingham Town, not a soul would look up, not a soul would look up, not a soul would look down to show me my way to where Nottingham Town. And so, what, what's that mean? The whole song is a riddle. Every single verse is a new riddle, and nobody remembers the answers to the no. riddle anymore no. because it was medieval. And it no, hasn't been sung in Great Britain for hundreds and hundreds of years. It was lost. 
but it came with a wave of people who ended up in the deepest hollows of Appalachia, and it was found by Alan Lomax and those people when they were looking for ballads, and they found this intact ballad that they had heard of, but had never known it still existed. And those people, it didn't matter where you went in that community, if even the ones who were at the greatest distance, they all sang the same version, and they all sang the same tune. And for Nottingham Town, I was wanting, I loved that song, because I like medieval song, that kind of modal sound, the minor songs, but it, I decided the other day, I had, a, after I talked to my daughter at one in the morning, I thought, oh, this is a song for us. No one looks up and no one looks down because they're all on their cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm painting the scroll of that as being <laughs> so the entire ballad, which works out perfectly for, about what technology has done to social relationships. Wow. And I'm really having fun with that. So I think from now, what was a madcap scheme is going to get just madder. <laughs> Perfect. I think Bob Dylan used Nottingham in town for Masters of War. He did. Yes. He did. That, right. that was, that for, which, was the, for which of his songs? Masters, masters of, of War. Oh, you Masters oh. of War. Oh. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, you talk a little bit about the orphan train, another song yes. you're working on? Yes, that was when I finished and I just gave a workshop at the Pacham School of the or Orphan Train. And it's the same as this, only shorter, little, a little slideshow about the history of the orphan train, which it was a train that in, uh, it was a social experiment that trying to figure out um, what to do with orphaned and abandoned or truant children in, in the eastern seaboard cities because after the Civil War there were thousands and thousands of children living on the street and refugees and immigrants were coming in on a daily basis, thousands a day and more. They were, it was just people pouring into the United States and they didn't know what to do about these children and there were no federal programs at all in place in those days. So a kind man devised this idea of the orphan train. He really didn't think it through very well, but it was to put children onto trains and just send them out west and give them to any Body who wanted a kid. They'd line the kids up on the train platform and you'd come along if you were a farmer or someone needing a boy in the field, say, I want that boy and I want that one and I'll take that little girl to scrub the dishes. And you could just take them and nobody kept very good records. And if, may I mention you? We have a person here in the audience, Susan Grimaldi, who Ross Grimaldi, her grandfather was on the orphan train as a two year old child. And when he was taken off the train in Missouri, was it Missouri? They, the people who took him, didn't have a name for him. He could, was too little to know his own name, and so they named him Bailey after the locomotive that brought him there. That was the name painted on the locomotive. And so they gave him a good, good enough life. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he was a, one of the, some of them were not such happy stories, and some were wonderfully, wonderfully happy. And you know, so that's what the Orphan Train Cranky is about. It's about the, a boy, Bailey, only he's a little older in the, in the song. And it's, it's sung, the song that's sung is the Utah Phillips song that's really a, just a great song. And, uh, and Mark and I sing it together. He plays the guitar, and I do the harmony. And it's, it's just a really pleasing ballad. And then the kids at the Pouchum School got to have a cranky workshop, and they made cardboard crankies. I knew it wouldn't work, and it, it did. It worked. <laughs> so, but that's one of them. I have, I have pretty poly. The Wife of Usher's Well, which nobody wants to hear because it's a story of unrelenting grief, a mother who's lost her children, another medieval story. But out of that, in that story are a lot of odd practices of grief that we still have remnants of today. How do you, how do you honor the dead and all that? She doesn't know her children are dead, but, but she wants them back and why she can't have them back. And it's a very beautiful song but, and a beautiful painting. I, the scroll is lovely, I think, for that one. And then, so, yeah, and then. Mm -hmm. Orphan Train, Pretty Polly, Watch Watch as well, and not in my town. And I'm just going to keep going until I can. You know, it's odd that we've never discussed this, Dee Dee, but when Charles and I were in Annapolis a few years ago, did I ever mention to you that I talked to a man who was going to the city hall, and he was on his 12,000th name. The books had not been opened for 200 years. These were people who were picked up anywhere in Great Britain not people, not any people, people who were children. If any child was found on the street, exactly. they, right. they took them, they, abs they abs uh, absconded, whatever the story of this, and they put them on boats and they brought them to this country, and many of those children ended up 
on the uh, trains, and he on these uh, orphan trains, mm -hmm. and they were called in unindentured servants. Right. Yeah. Well, so the fact that free. your yeah. grandfather was able, at some point, it appears, to uh, please his his owner adequately, or had good enough luck to be able to uh, apparently start a family yes. that fl flourished. It wasn't. It's true that many, it's extraordinary. many of these children had parents who wanted them, but bunch the children had been snatched on the streets. Right. They, you didn't get wow. them back, was, and the records were pretty haphazard. Yeah. And um, there are thousands and yeah. thousands in every port uh, community along the eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. Is there it's a it's happening right, right now. now. It is. Well, that's why I like this. I like yeah, this particularly yeah. because of, of what's going on at the border with the children being warehoused and kept in cages. It's, and then sold to the, the highest bidder to good Christian homes. This seemed to me to be a parallel. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do it. Are you going to do a sequel to the show with some of these other crankies? You haven't talked to them. <laughs> yes, please. I'd be glad to do a sequel. I, 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 it's better than standing out on the street and getting run off. <laughs> but the police were breaking on the streets. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I love doing I love doing this. It puts it puts for me this was the first one I painted by myself and um, not really what first one for a long time. And it, it, I had trouble thinking about the sequences of it and is it a, you know, I don't want it to look like a coloring book, but as I've gone I want the story to be clear. And it's it's an interesting and tricky kind of balance of because in art, my style of art is to go from catastrophe to catastrophe as I paint. And I obliterate everything, and I start over, and it's all just a great big teetering mess until finally I feel satisfied. It looks like oatmeal, and I'm happy with it. And, and we can't do that with this. You can't, the paper won't let you keep scrubbing and scratching. And so I had to, I had to try to color in the lines. Well, and then you also have to align it with the words, with your yes. song. And yeah. you notice one little problem, I bet. The people who yes. sold this paper to me said it was 18 inches wide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I made my theater from, this is just uh -huh. a, a piece of wallboard that hooks on here with Velcro, right? Uh -huh. From Summers, not right. Summers, Aubuchons. Right. Mm -hmm. But I made my theater while I was waiting for the paper to come. And because the paper's 18 inches wide, I made it for the 18 inch wide paper, and the paper turns out to be just a little bit over 17 inches, so it was sticking out. So I had to take some bedding that the dog had chewed up and made a little curtain, <laughs> but it won't stay in place. So I'm going to try something else. <laughs> the dog eats sheets. Yes. How many feet is the cranky? Uh, Probably about 30 feet. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I think that would be, a, I try, started measuring and then kind of got, I forgot where I was. Do you have canvas or paper? It's paper. It's called butcher paper, okay. and they used to sell it everywhere. Yeah. Now they sell it with plastic on one side, and that doesn't work for the paint. And um, and it's sold in pieces, ready to wrap your sandwich in a deli or something. So I had ordered this from a place that still does it. Uh, there, there's stuff called Tyvek. There was a scroll, a painting, of, a slide that went by very quickly of a cranky eye painted years ago on Tyvek that house wrapping stuff, yes. and it was a marvelous mess because the paint pops off in unexpected ways. <laughs> and it leaves a really, really terrible look that I liked. <laughs> and Tyvek now is being made with, with a paper-thin version that's meant for artists to paint on. And it doesn't have a very long shelf life, but neither do I, so I might get it <laughs> and try that. Phoebe, when I saw this in your living room, it was back to the can you talk about that for a few minutes? The issues of cranky are often backlit, and it, when that's handy, is if you're going to want to use shadow puppets with it. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to, if you're going to do Foxman on a stormy night, you have the landscape going this way, but you want the fox progressing to the the den and home and to the farmyard and whatever wherever he's going. You have they make a little paper fox on a stick, and he gets run along behind here. I don't know how they they must have many arms. Um, he gets run along behind, and the light from behind makes him a shadow, a shadow fox moving along through a painted landscape. And it's very nice, but because of the way I paint, it was such an ungodly mess that to put the light behind, there are places where the paint's a real thick blob, and then that's just a big black spot. What would you tell the Christmas lights around the outside? That would be jolly. That would be very jolly. I would like that. <laughs> I, I saw it. It was such a mess. It was, it was 
was quite beautiful. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I worked on it after Dee's that. talking. And yeah. I, turned it, <laughs> I turned it this dark brown afterwards, too, so the light doesn't oh, come through so well. That is, yeah, the dark brown is another psychological mystery I'll never understand. I like things that look like they were just dug up. Have you ever Mark? <laughs> I met him before I felt that way. <laughs> Have you ever worked on fabric? It, I would like to work on fabric. And a lot of people do make quilts, sort of essentially quilts for their Frankies. But I don't have a sewing machine, and I don't know that gluing to fabric would be very satisfying for me. Um, you can get really long pieces of, of silk and uh, silk would be lovely. and uh, uh, canvas, and, and they're on rolls. And I could tell you how to get them. I would love that, because mm -hmm. this, this has its drawbacks. The, the, you know, people from Red Puppet said, oh, when it starts to wear out, you just take contact paper and put it along the back. Well, that's the kind of job that I could see me bungling fabulously and having it stuck over the back in crumbling wads. I just don't know how, how you would do that. They come in all kinds of widths, up to 54 yeah, that inches. That would be good. Yeah, that would I'll, I'll ask how it can do that, because I would like to try something that has a little, it, it isn't going to rip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it. Thank you very much.